In the Gospel of Mark, one of the four Gospels to begin the New Testament, there is this really interesting theme that shows up that really describes what it looks like to follow Jesus. And before we begin what we want to talk about in Malachi today, I just wanted to show this to you to kind of frame our conversation. In Mark chapter 1, verse 16, it says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Notice in, in both occasions, uh, Jesus will call. And the response to Jesus' call is, one, a turning away from where they're currently headed, what they're currently committed to, whether it's the father Zebedee or whether it's the, the nets in their boat, their business. And they turn toward Jesus, a turning away from and a turning toward. So this continues in, in, in Mark 2, verse 13. Mark continues the theme. He says, once again, Jesus was, went out beside the lake and a large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up, right? got up from his tax collector's booth. And followed him, leaving behind what you're committed to, the vision you have for your life, what you're planning, turning away from it, and following Jesus. This kind of comes to its culmination in Mark chapter 8, which is a very famous passage, Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And if you really want to know what does it look like to follow Jesus, like what does it genuinely look, look like to become a disciple, the follower of Jesus, this is where I would point you. Mark 8, 34, then, then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple, right? Whoever wants to be my follower, this is what has to happen. He must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. You hear that? Losing your life for me and the gospel. In other words, you've got to turn away from that, right? Deny yourself. And follow me. This is, this is language that we use uh, in theological circles of, of, of what we call repentance. And that's a word you don't use a whole lot, I think, in everyday language these days. Hey, you need to repent of that. You don't say that to your kids. You, you say to them, hey, you need to stop doing that and start doing what I'm asking you to do. That, what you're calling your kids to do is to repent of their actions, a change of mind. You want them to agree with your take on it. And be committed in their heart to say, yes, I agree with you. That is not the way I want to go. I want to go this way. And then they show their repentance by their actions, by demonstrating it in what the Bible calls fruits of repentance, meaning you're walking with Jesus. You're actually following him. Um, my wife uh, sometimes likes to make sure that she tells me that my my shirt is not the right shirt to be wearing. You've probably noticed that uh, fashion is not something I care a great deal about. And so she, she will occasionally, uh, when I walk into the kitchen with my shirt that I'm going to wear for the day, uh, she will say to me, is that, is that really what you're going to wear today? Is that the one? And that is my signal to, to turn around immediately, to go back to the room and find something else. So I stand in front of the closet, you know, praying that the Lord will grant me a shirt that she will not bristle at. But what she's doing is she's asking me to repent of my shirt, <laughs> to, to, to look down at my shirt, agree with her take on it, and say, actually, yes, this shirt is horrible, and go back and show fruits of that repentance, fruits of that change of mind by changing my shirt. That's what repentance is. That's what it means to follow Jesus in Scripture. Why am I talking about this when we're talking about the book of Malachi? To be honest with you, the book of Malachi actually is all about repentance. This is what God is calling the people of Israel to do. He's saying, look, you're acting in this way. I need you to turn away from it, and I want you to follow me. And I don't care how much, if you're not willing to repent, right? I don't care how much you know, religious ritual you do or whatever. I, what really matters to me is your heart, is, is your commitment to obey me, is your commitment to follow me. So what you're doing now is not right. So turn and turn toward me. Turn away from and turn toward me. 
So this passage in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 to 12 is all about repentance. Uh, it's God calling his people to forsake the road they're on and turn back to him. And in it, you're going to find a few things said about repentance. Number one, that there's a grace in repentance. Second, there's a reason for repentance. And fi finally, there's a joy in repentance. So the grace for repentance, the reason for repentance, and the joy in repentance. So here's the first of those, the grace for repentance. In, in verse 6 of Malachi chapter 3, I, the Lord, don't change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. So return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Um, ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned uh, away. Uh, if you sat down and read the entire Old Testament in one sitting, or just even the, even the historical books in the Old Testament, one of the things that you would realize very quickly about Israel, that is a good description of them. Every time uh, they, every, ever since the time of the very beginning, right, Abraham, and they turn away from the Lord. The Lord makes a covenant, and they say, he says, right, we're gonna, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to commit myself to blessing you, and then they just keep turning away over and over again. In fact, at one point, there's a, uh, a, a kind of an object lesson that God initiates with a guy named um, Hosea. Hosea is a prophet, and the Lord says, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to go and marry this woman named Gomer. She's a prostitute. And so he does, okay? He goes, marries this woman, Gomer. But Gomer, being a prostitute, she, she, she is with him for a little while, Hosea, for a little while, and then she ends up going out to, to do her prostituting with other places. And then, he, and then you know, Hosea's been sent out to, you need to go and bring her back. And the Lord says after this whole kind of object story, what a difficult object uh, lesson for, for Hosea. But he says at the end of it, look, this is the way Israel treats me. Israel's like Gomer. Like I've committed to her, I've chosen her, I've brought her unto my home, and yet she keeps going out and she keeps finding other guys. And yeah, that's the, way, that's the way it worked for them. Ever since the time of their ancestors, they've turned away from his decrees and, and, not, and not kept them. And you would expect that the Lord would respond to that, like anybody who was constantly being rejected. You would expect the way that we would, you know, Lord would respond to that would be, right, I'm done with you. Like, I'm, I'm finished. I don't, I don't care what I said before. I, you know, you've proven through your actions that you are not worth the time or effort, right? And when I made the choice for you, I didn't realize that you were going to be this much of a mess. So you expect the Lord to change his mind. That's what any one of us would do. And yet, you notice how this passage began? I, the Lord, do not change. Like, even though you guys are doing all of that stuff, I, I the Lord, well, I, I, don't, I don't change. You know, if, uh, it, we were the NFL draft, the National Football League draft just happened a little bit ago. And I love watching the NFL draft because it, like, it's the dreams come true for all of these, these, young, these young men who uh, have been, you know, committed themselves to play football for all these years, gotten all the concussions, fought, you know, the, the position battles all these days, and have, they've come out on top as being the best players available that year. But usually happens in the NFL draft is that some of these, these kids, they are kids, they're like 21 years old, they, they, they are drafted, and there's a huge amount of hype around them. And then, you know, a year later, two years later, there's the reality of who they are actually kind of shows up. There's a guy named Ryan Leaf years ago who was drafted second overall. He was a quarterback, and he, after a couple of years, showed that he was, he was a terrible NFL quarterback. Jamarcus Russell, these are names that some of you don't, might not even know. They, he was the top pick, and he was a quarterback, and he was terrible. He was terrible. And what happened with the teams is they said, oh, my goodness, we made this choice for you. Uh, we invested all this time and energy in you. And we've come to realize that you are not good at this game. Not like we thought you would be. And so what, what do they do? They change their mind about them. They, they release them. They trade them. They do whatever. And they're like, you know what? We're moving on to somebody who's worth our time and effort. Well, I do think that this is the way that most of us think about ourselves in relation to God. We say, yes, yes, I totally get it. Um, the Lord, he, he, he chooses. The Lord, he uh, has committed to dedicate himself to me. The Lord has, for some reason, chosen to love me. 
but he's probably like those NFL teams who after they draft, he, after he drafted me, after a little while, he realizes what he actually got and what he got was not, was not what he expected. So I'm just here waiting for him to, you know, to cut me. I think most Christians in their, deep down in their heart, feel that way. They're like, why in the world would the Lord ever have anything to do with me? And I, I, there are, it will be a time where I go too far and I act too, you know, grievously. There's, I, I, I will wrong him too much and he will eventually say, we're done with you returning. I'm, I'm going to somebody who's worth more my time and, and my eth- effort. And yet what this passage is saying is, no, that's not, that's not at all the way the Lord thinks. You've, Israel's walked away from him all this time, and yet the Lord doesn't change. Israel changes their mind constantly about whether they want to follow God, but the Lord doesn't change. And so that's why he makes this offer in this passage. He said, return to me, and I will return to you. But because I don't change... You can always come back. You can always turn around from the direction that you're going. And I'll bring and I'll be there waiting for you. If you return to me, then I, man, I'm ready to return to you. So I just want to pause for a minute and think a little bit about this more deeply. Um, I do think, like Israel, we change our minds about loving God all the time, but God, like I said, doesn't change his mind about loving us. He's chosen me. He's not disappointed about it. And he's committed to pursue me. That's actually the truth. He's chosen me. He's not disappointed about it. He's not surprised at who I am, really. And he's chosen to pursue me simply because he chose to love. So in Psalm 23, verse 6, you get kind of a signal to this. Psalm 23, 6, which is the end of that great psalm, Psalm 23, you get the Lord saying, um, or sorry, the psalmist saying, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. That word follow, though, in, in that passage actually is probably better translated pursue. Surely your goodness and love will pursue me all the days of my life. In other words, uh, you are my shepherd, Lord. You have dis- I'm your sheep, and I know I wander all over the place and do all sorts of things, and you are actually going to keep after, you're going to keep after me. You're going to keep pursuing me no matter, no matter what. I don't know if you've ever been to a store before and you, and, uh, uh, you know, maybe, it, maybe you've, you, you're there to buy a printer or you're there to buy a, uh, you know, some expensive product. Maybe you've gone to a car dealership. You know what it's like when, you, when, when you're buying something like that and the salesman is on commission or whatever? Like, and when you go to a car dealership, this is one of the first things that they tell you is that when you show up to the edge of the car dealership, you know, if you're with somebody who's bought a car before, they'll turn to you and say, okay, just, just be aware that as soon as we step onto this property, there will be a fight between two or three people inside of that building over there, right? That's like the beehive. One of those bees is going to come out here and try to sting us. And so you, you, sometimes you walk around and hiding behind the cars because you just want to look and, you know, kind of become clandestine and treat it like it's the internet, like you're just browsing anonymously to see the cars. Uh, but eventually somebody comes out and, it, you, you know, I've, I've bought cars before. I've done, I've done it with some friends before. And when the guy comes out, I've actually tried to hide from him. You know, you go around the corner, you walk a little bit more quickly to another one of the SUVs so you can hide behind it and then you duck the other way. No matter what happens they always find you. They pursue you. Sometimes you walk around, around the corner and there they are and they're saying, hello, right? With their chest hair, hello. That is a good image, I think, for the kind of pursuing that the Lord is, is trying to do. The difference, of course, is that, you know, when we think about car salesmen, we think to ourselves, like, well, they just want it for their own benefit and they don't want to really help me and they want to get as much as they can out of me. Actually, the Lord pursues us for our sake. He comes after us and he keeps coming after us so that he will bring us, that he can bring us back to the relationship that, it, that is good for us. It's an act, in fact, of pure grace. He could let us go. He should let us go. But he's like, I'm not going to let you go because I don't want you to go over to that other thing which is going to actually crush you. In the scriptures, it actually says the Lord is, he's jealous. 
He's a jealous God. And we think about jealousy, but jealousy is a bad thing for us because when we're jealous, we want it, we, we, we're jealous because we want that person for our sake, you know? But when God is jealous, he's like, you know what? Actually, I want it, I want it for your sake because I'm the greatest thing, says the Lord. And if you go to some other God or some other thing, you're, you're actually going to be less. It's going to be less for you than, than who I am. So he pursues us and he chases us down. And it's like, it's like we, we're running away from him. We're in the woods and we run out of steam and we look kind of behind us around the tree to see if he's still chasing us because we don't want anything to do with him, right? We, we stray away from him and then we look up and there he is. And he says, are you done yet? Are you ready to come home? No, and we run a little bit further and then we get exhausted and then we look back and the Lord's there again. Are you, are you done yet? And then we go a little bit further, and the further we go into the woods, the deeper and darker it gets, and the more trouble we get in. And the Lord is always there waiting, repeatedly saying to us, you know, if you return to me, I'll return to you. You can always come home. Are you, are you done yet? Max Lucado is an author who uh, wrote a bunch of books in the 80s and 90s, mostly. He was a pastor. Uh, one of his delightful little books is called No Wonder They Call Him Savior. He was really good at writing like one, one chapter, little pithy short story type things. And one of the stories he wrote goes like this. Uh, Longing to leave her poor Brazilian neighborhood, Christina wanted to see the world. Discontent with a home, having only a pallet on the floor, a wash basin, and a wood-burning stove, she dreamed of a better life in this city. One morning, she slipped away, breaking her mother's heart. Knowing what life on the streets would be like for her young, attractive daughter, Maria hurriedly packed to go find her. On her way to the bus stop, she entered a drugstore to get one last thing. She, she needed pictures. She sat in the photograph booth, closed the curtain, and spent all the money she could on pictures of herself. With her purse full of small black and white photos, she boarded the next bus to Rio de Janeiro. Maria knew Christina, had no way of earning uh, money. She also knew that her daughter was too stubborn to give up. And you know that when pride meets hunger, a woman will, be, will do things that were before unthinkable. Knowing this, Maria began her search. She went to bars and hotels and nightclubs, any place with a reputation for streetwalkers and, and prostitutes. She went to them all. And at each place, she left her picture. She taped it on, on the bathroom mirror, tacked it to a hotel bulletin board. He, she fastened it to a corner of a phone booth. And on the back of each photo, she wrote the same note. It wasn't too long before both the money and the pictures ran out and Maria had to go home. So this weary mother wept as the bus began its long journey back to her small village. It was a few weeks later that young Christina descended the hotel stairs. Her young face was tired. Her brown eyes no longer danced with youth, but spoke of pain and of fear. Her laughter was broken. Her dream had become a nightmare. A, th a thousand times over, she had longed to trade these countless beds for her secure pallet in her small village, yet that little village, in too many ways, was too far away. But as she reached the bottom of the stairs, her eyes noticed a familiar face. She looked again, and there on the lobby mirror was a small picture of her mother, Christina's eyes burned and her throat tightened as she walked across the room and, and removed the small photo. And written on the back was this compelling invitation. Whatever you've done, whatever you've become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. And she did. That's the offer that the Lord makes to the people of Israel. It's the offer that the Lord makes to any one of us who's chosen to run away from him and seek things that are not of him, that are costing us so much. He's jealous for us, for our sake. 
you can always come home. So you can see there's a, there's a grace in, in repentance. Our pursuing God is acting graciously toward us when he should turn us away. But in this passage, I, I want to show you the reason that the Lord is making this offer to the people of Israel. Like what, what specifically have they done that he needs to call them to repent about? So you look at the second part of, chapter, of verse 7, you get the reason for repentance. Um, but you ask, how are we to return? So return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. Okay, but, but you ask, how are we to return? And here's God's reply. Will a, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You see, you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. So bring the whole tithe into this storehouse that there may be food in my house. See, here's the problem. You guys are, you guys are stealing from me. You wonder why everything's going wrong and why you're struggling and why it is that you're crying at the altar in the chapter before with tears, you're flooding the altar with tears saying, why aren't you answering my prayer? And why is it that things aren't going well for us? And why, why, why? And the Lord's response is, look, a number of things in this book, but in this case, uh, look, you're, you're robbing me. You're thieves. And they're like, what do you mean we're thieves? When did we, when did we steal anything from you? In tithes and offerings, he says. Wait a minute. Okay, what are, what are we talking about here? So there's some historical background that you need to know, some stuff about the Old Testament and the laws that were in place then what you, that you need to know. So um, what are tithes and offerings? Uh, the way that it worked was uh, the Lord gave the people of Israel, Israel, he gave them the land. But when he gave them the land, the understanding was that it's the Lord's land, and he was giving it to them for their possession, basically to be steward, stewards over it. So because it's the Lord's land and it belonged to him, the fruit of the land also belonged to him. And he had a, he had a requirement. Basically, I will, I will let you keep 90% of the fruit of my land. But you have to bring 10% of it to me. And by fruit, we're talking about things like um, grain and fruit and flocks and herds. I want you to take a tenth of everything that you end up growing or gaining in this land. And I want you to bring it to me. And to me means I want you to bring it to the temple. And I want you to give it, basically, to the temple. Now, the Levites, the priests, were the ones who were actually going to, because they couldn't own land and go out and actually make money off of the land, they were going to be taken care of through this tenth, through this tithe. That's what they called it. The Levites, in turn, right, so they're going to receive this tenth, they're supposed to produce offerings, um, which is basically what they kind of call the tithe tax. So the people of the land are given 10% so the Levites can take care of it. And then they, the Levites, or so the Levites can uh, eat and be taken care of. And then, the, and then the, there's a tenth that the Levites now will give to the Lord. So it's, it, the offerings were a tithe on the tithe. So when this passage says, look, God says, look, you're robbing me. And how are we robbing you, they say. He says, in tithes and offerings. In other words, you're not, you're not giving the tenth. And you Levites, you, you priests, you're not giving the tenth. So what needs to happen is that you need to bring the whole tithe into this storehouse. Some of you might be giving 1%, other people 2%, other people 5%. But you need to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That's the law. So the question you have to ask is, okay, well, what happened if these tithes and offerings were withheld in whole or in part? Like, what if they didn't do this stuff? Well, um, here's the way it worked in the Old Testament. The, the, the way that the law worked with, for the people of Israel was what's called uh, the deuteronomistic principle. You don't need to remember that, but you can use it in, re, in conversations with your friends later and get extra, extra, extra credit Christian points. The deuteronomistic principle is basically, look, it, God says, as part of his covenant, look, if you do good, Israel, you will receive good from me. 
but if you do bad, you'll receive cursing from me. It's very simple. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. So what if you don't keep the law? What if you don't do this, this tithing in, in Israel? Well, that's bad. Therefore, you'll get bad. If you don't do the tithing, then you'll be under a curse. Did you see the language in there? Verse 9, you are under a curse, says the Lord, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Don't you understand that you're breaking the rules of the covenant? And because you're breaking the rules, I am responding with curses. If you want the blessing, follow the covenant. Now, listen, when I, when I say all of that, there's lots and lots of people who immediately are like, yeah, that's the way it works for Christians too. There are people called prosperity teachers these days who come out and say, yeah, you listen, if you give God good stuff, he's going to give you good stuff back. If you tithe, if you give a certain amount of money to the church, then the Lord, you're to seed and that seed will grow and then you will get money in response. Look, there are passages like this one in Malachi 3 that promise it. The problem is that Christian people are not under this covenant. We are actually under the new covenant. And under the new covenant, see, what happened is that Jesus fulfilled this covenant. If the deal was, if you do good, you get good, and you do bad, you get bad, we kept doing bad, right? Israel kept doing bad. They couldn't get good because they were always doing bad. And so along comes the fulfillment of Israel, the true Israel, Jesus. And he does good all the time. He keeps the law completely. He follows it 100%, and because of that, he earns the blessing of God. And he says, all those who have faith in me, who are over here and they can't do good, they can't do good, they can't do good, all of those who have faith in me can actually have the blessings of God, not because of anything they did, but because of what, what I did. So, Christian people then are not people who are obligated to the Old Testament law like this. Christian people are people who've already been blessed in Christ. And so the, why then should Christian people give? So the prosperity teachers are going to say, you should give so you can get lots of money back. Right? You, you, should, you should give to be blessed. But for Christians, we don't give to be blessed. We give because we're blessed because of what Jesus has does, because we have all of the blessings of the covenant, because we got it by faith and because we didn't do it by works and because God has been gracious in this way, even though we're failures, we respond to that by giving. We don't try to impress God to get it because we've already got it. So the Apostle Paul, when he comes to an opportunity to ask for money, from a, from a Christian church in the New Testament. One of the things that you would expect, look, if we're still under this, this Old Testament you know, tithing system, uh, you would expect the Lord to, or Paul to come along and say, listen, what you guys need to do is you need to, give me, you need to give me money because the law says so. Don't you know that? I mean, if you give God good stuff, he's going to give you good stuff in return. But that's not what he says. He comes, he's collecting money for a collection because the church in Jerusalem has got, uh, is in famine. So he comes along and he says in 2 Corinthians 8, 8 to 9, he comes to the Corinthians, he said, I want you to give to this collection. And why? He said, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. He just had talking about how this other church had given a lot of money. And he's like, look, I'm not commanding you to do what they're, they're doing, but I wanted to show you what they did because of how thankful they were for the gospel. Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake, he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. In other words, I want you to respond to the gospel of Jesus. I want you to respond to what God has blessed you with in Jesus. So we as Christians, we do, like I said, we don't give money to God in order to be blessed. We give money to God because we're blessed. But, but... While we're, we're not under the old covenant so that withholding money brings a curse, the value of giving, as you can see even in that passage, the value of giving is as clear in the New Testament as it is in the Old Testament. Specifically, giving a portion of money to the Lord demonstrates our posture toward Him. That's the similarity. In the old covenant, 
committing yourself to the tithe demonstrated your trust in the Lord and your commitment to him. In the New Testament, giving your money, maybe it's not a tithe, maybe it's not a tenth, giving your money in response to the gospel says an awful lot about how you view the gospel. This is an awful lot about how much you view God and your dependence on him. My kids, when they were little, we, we all of them uh, had what, what in New Zealand was called a dummy, right? And that's not a reference to their father. That is a reference to, their, um, to what we call a binky or a pacifier. All my kids had it. Lots of people in New Zealand were like, don't kid, give your kid a, a dummy. Don't give your kid a, a pacifier because if you do, they'll, you know, they'll end up becoming you know, axe murderers or something. But we didn't, we didn't care. We wanted the kids to be quiet. <laughs> so we gave them this, this cork and, and told them, you know, you need to suck on this so that we can, you know, not lose our minds. There comes to a point, though, in the life of a child that they're so addicted, they, they, they depend so much on, these, on this binky, that there comes a point at which you have to kind of give it up. And so there's like, for our kids anyway, it was almost like a ritual. We pulled out the scissors, and we had the binky, and, and they were going to cut off the silicone sucky part of it. This is a really hard thing for a kid to do, right? They're sitting there, and they're thinking to themselves, do I want to keep going forward depending upon this thing to give me joy and happiness and peace in the moments where I struggle. Like I feel good knowing always that I have this binky with me. That's the way it was, right? Or do I want to go into my future by relying on my parents now, by relying on uh, them to care for me without this crutch? And so the kids, you can see them, the tears in their eyes, they take their scissors and they snip off the binky, and it's gone. This is a signal, basically, that I don't need this. I don't want to be the kind of person who's keep going down the, the path and being 18 years old, sucking on a binky. So I, I don't need this anymore. So I'm going to commit myself to being done, done with it. To be honest, the giving in to God is basically this. Giving to the Lord is basically this. What you're saying to the Lord is, I don't need this money. I need you. I'm willing to get rid of this, be done with it, hand over this portion to it, even especially if it's sacrificial. I'm willing to give it to you as a sign, Lord, that my life is not driven by how much money I have and the security that it provides me. I'm going to give it to you because my life is cared for by you. And you own the cattle on a thousand hills. And if I need some money, you'll just sell some of them and give me what I need. The Apostle Paul, actually, at one point in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse, verses 10, he's He's talking to the Philippian church, and he's thankful that they've given him a financial gift, right? Because he wasn't able to feed himself, actually, in prison and other things. So they've given him a financial gift through this guy named Epaphroditus who showed up and is willing now to pay for some of the stuff that he needs. And so he says thank you to them in Philippians 4.10. He says, I, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you at last you renewed your concern for me. And thanks for the money. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, though. For I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I, I know what it is to be in need. Like I know, I know not to, what it's like not to have money. I, I know what it is to have plenty, too. I know what it's like to have lots of money. I've learned the secret, listen, the secret of being content in any and every situation, wouldn't you like to know that secret? When you don't have any money and we have a lot, when you don't, things aren't going for, well for you or then they are going well for you, that you can have the same attitude in each case. Wouldn't that be delightful and amazing? You're not freaking out in each case. The money doesn't mean everything to you and losing it doesn't mean everything to you. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. See, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. In other words, if I've got Jesus, I've got enough. Do you know how most of us put ourselves in that situation? 
to learn that lesson, the secret of contentment, the act of giving. Demonstrating to God that, look, I don't need the money. I can live without the money, but I can't live without you. And I trust you, Lord, to give me what it is that I need. And I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Giving money to the Lord is an act that reinforces our dependence on him. It says we trust him, we trust what we have and what we will have in, in, the, days, in the days ahead. So there's this guy in the, in the New Testament that's called the rich ruler, and he comes to Jesus and says, I, I've, how do, what do I do to be saved? I've kept the whole law, I've done everything, can you tell me what to do? And Jesus looks at him and recognizes that he loves his money more than he loves anything else. And so Jesus said, well, I need you to go and give away all your money. I need you to sell, sell all your possessions, uh, take the money and give it to the poor, and then you can come follow me. In other words, I need you to basically demonstrate that the money that you have is not going to stand in the way of you following me. I need you to demonstrate that, I can, that you, you know I can care for you. And the, you don't need the money to care for you. Of course, you know the story. The rich ruler, he, he hears that. But because he's very wealthy, he walks away sad. Are we supposed to give away everything? Are we supposed to be like the rich ruler and give all of it away? How much are we supposed to give away? That's usually the question. That, I don't want to be like the rich ruler. I want to demonstrate that. I want that secret of contentment. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be like that. So what, how much do I give? That's usually a question that everybody asks at this particular point. How much do I give? And the answer is as much as you can afford given your circumstances. Yeah, but what about 10%? 10% is probably a really good place to start, to be honest with you. Like the gospel's worth more than 10% of, uh, of your income. Who do I give it to? You know what? There's a priority in the local church in the, in the scriptures, and that seems to be the central place that people give. There are also other things, like in this case, the Apostle Paul gets it from one church is giving him money that's extra to take care of him as a missionary. But 10% is a good place to start. Is it a law? No, it's not a law. What if I give less? God's not going to judge you because you're, because, you, because you're righteous in Christ. But why wouldn't you give more? Is it because you depend too much on the money? Maybe you should sell your possessions to give to the poor and then go follow him. So you can see the reason for repentance is the fact that they're just not giving rightly. Here's the, here's the last one. There's a joy in repentance. Uh, second part of verse 10. Test me in this, says the Lord. And see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there won't be room enough to store it. So the blessing he's talking about in the floodgates, so it's rain. He's saying, listen, rain is the, like the currency of the day. If the rain falls on the land, the crops go, the cattle can eat, have little cattle babies, and away we go. So watch, if you test me, see that if you give this money to me, if you actually follow the covenant, see what I'll do. See whether or not I'm, I'm trustworthy. See whether or not I'm capable, actually, of taking care of you. And he says, I'll, the rain is going to come so much. I, in fact, I'll prevent uh, pests from devouring your crop, like locusts. I won't, I won't let them come. And the vines in your fields will, will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, right? You, you get lots and lots of grapes. Lots and lots of grapes. There won't be a hailstorm that comes and blows them, you know, so all the fruit drops off of them. Then, verse 12, all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Test me in this. This is the point here. Test me in this. See if I'm not true to my word. I bought a bed online a number of years ago, which is a crazy idea, right? Usually go and you go to the bed store and you lay on every one of the beds while the salesman follows you around saying, how about this one? How about this one? How about this one? Talk about aggressive. But when you're online, you're like, man, I don't know. So you go by people's comments. But you also want to guarantee. So what you do is you buy this bed online based on all the comments. And usually the companies, the Casper, which is who we bought our bed from, says, Right, this bed's gonna come to you in a box. I know that's weird, but uh, if you don't like it, like, we will come and get it from you. You have 100 days to decide whether or not you like it, and we'll come and get the thing for you. It's a money-back guarantee, right? Try it. This is precisely what the Lord is saying here. 
Try it. See if you don't love this. Israel, I know you think you need the money to take care of all the things around you, but you don't need the money. You need me. So give the money to me. Follow the covenant, and you will see that I will follow the rules of the covenant. I'm, in fact, dying and excited to do it. He's daring the people to put their trust in him. He's like, burn the ships, guys. Burn them. Give the money to me. Put yourself in a really sacrificial, difficult position. So the only way is for me to come through for you. And you see, I will, I will, I will, I will. I will come through. So in other words, um, the point, I think, here at the end is if you turn away from trusting yourself and trust God with all your life, he will deliver. This idea of repentance, the reason that we don't want to turn around from the direction that we're going and turn toward Jesus is because we're not sure. We're not sure if he can be trusted to take care of us like we think we can take care of us. And so we don't, we don't want to jump. But look, even in that, in that book in Philippians, the Apostle Paul writes basically, the book of Philippians is basically a thank you letter for the money that it was given to him. And in Philippians 4.19, just a few verses after what I just read, it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches, the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. In other words, hey, hey, I get it. You church, you, this church, you guys are giving me money. I don't necessarily need the money because I have not learned the secret of contentment, but I'm so thankful to have it. But look, you can't outgive God. When you give money to missionaries, when you give money to the church, when you give money, like you somehow think that you're turning away from the good life? Look, it's not probably gonna look like you thought. You might not have the house that you thought you would have. You might not have the car you thought you have. But you will find out that you didn't need the house and you didn't need the car in order to have true joy. Turning to Jesus and following him and learning that secret of contentment and embracing it, that's joy. That's true joy. But why don't we do it? I don't know, the same reason that a kid stands on the, on the diving board and he's shaking. His dad's like, jump, just jump. But the kid's shaking. Your dad, you're like, why are you not going to? You actually think that I don't have the capability of catching you and holding you up in the water. And the kid's like, no, no, my life is way better here on the shore. And he's shaking and shaking. You're saying, jump, jump, jump. And when the son or daughter jumps, what they find, when they turn away from the safety and comfort and all the things that they have trusted in in order to make them happy and secure, when they turn away from that and they turn toward the Lord. When they jump, they find the same thing that every child finds when they jump to their daddy's arms. That he can be dependent on. And the water is way more fun than the shore is. Some people have been asking me recently, um, aren't you a little bit concerned moving away from a, a a ministry that things are going really well and, and um, m- moving to a place that you don't know what's going to happen uh, that's had some difficulties recently. Are, are, you, are you not worried that some of those difficulties will end up bleeding over you and then you'll get kick, kicked in the stomach and you know, you'll, you'll, you'll lose what it is that you have? And I gotta, I'll be honest, when people say that to me, I'm like, well, I, I would be more worried if I didn't know that God can be trusted and that every turn in my life that I have ever taken to jump off of that board into his arms, he has always caught me and the adventure has been far greater than I could ever imagine. So go and do likewise. He can be trusted. Turn away from where you're headed. Turn away from the things that are away from him and return to him and he will return to you. Let me pray. Father, I'm thankful for your grace and for a passage like this that, uh, yeah, Lord, reminds us of all, all the ways that you are trustworthy and capable and caring and loving, and that, quite honestly, Lord, we don't risk enough for you. We just don't. I pray you, you would help us to. You'd help us to see how grand you are. You're going to have to fill our minds, Father, with your glory and your excellence and your trustworthiness and the, your never-changingness and your grace so that we will look and say, you're right, I'm a fool not to jump. So Father, help us jump. Wherever that is, however that is, looks like today, I pray that you would help us to jump.
and cast all of ourselves into your hands, we pray in Jesus' name.